for here today simply because you heard about the program and wanted to have the opportunity to hear the Poet Laureate. Before I introduce our special guest, I want to recognize the literary friends of the DC Public Library who are co-sponsoring this program with us. You will hear a few words from one of the friends at the end of the program. But are there literary friends present? Just raise your hand so that we can acknowledge you. <laughs> I told you I was standing in for Dr. Franklin. You see, he's here. Before I introduce our special guest, my name is Hardy Franklin, and I'm delighted to see so many of you here today, and especially the students. I rode up on the elevator with three who just wanted to know where Rita Dove was speaking. So uh, I was very happy to comply. You will hear a few words from one of the friends, Avita Shashani, uh, at the end of the program. And I also want to express a special thanks to the DC Community Humanities Council, which has provided funding not only to bring our guest here today, but also to purchase copies of one of her books. Um, uh, Ms. Johnson will hold that book up so that you'll see. And we have an array here of material that she has been a part of. She's really very productive, and that, that is very nice. The Humanities Council has supported many programs and activities here at the library. And we are grateful that the council provided needed support for this special event. Finally, before I introduce our guest, I would like to thank the staff who worked very hard to put this program together, especially Betsy Madeira, branch librarian at our Tacoma Park Library. Stand up, dear. She's worked very hard over the past several months from the initial in invitation to the grant application and to coordinating all of the logistics for this day. Um, I might also say that she was not selfish because this was something that she was trying to do for uh, Tacoma Park uh, branch in its community. But then she felt that it was big enough uh, to have the whole system share. So that's why we're here together. Thanks also to Maria Salvador, our coordinator of children's services. Hold your hand up over there, dear. For coordinating the participation of the students. And I understand we had many more classes who wanted to be a part of today, but we did not have enough space for all of them. Rita Duff is currently the Poet Laureate of the United States and consultant in poetry at the Library of Congress. In addition, she is Commonwealth Professor of English at the University of Virginia. Ms. Dove has published many books, including not only poetry, but also fiction. In 1987, she received the Pulitzer Prize for her collection of poetry, entitled Thomas and Beulah, which is included in the book that I had in my hand. Uh, today, the invited students here will receive a signed copy of her 1993 publication, Selected Poems. Now, she's been nice enough to sign every copy that uh, you will get today. That's a lot of work by itself. Although Ms. Dove, uh, Ms. Dove's many honors are grants from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts, the 1993 NAACP Great American Artist Award, the 1994 Renaissance Forum Award for Leadership in the Literary Arts from the Folger Shakespeare Library, and she's received seven honorary doctorates. How many of you know what an honorary doctorate is? Thanks. You can tell me after. I'm delighted that you're aware of it. They're, they're not easy to come by. In 1993, Rita Dove was the first poet to give an official reading 
at the White House in more than a decade. Her presentation today is entitled, So You've Never Met a Poet. Since my professional life has been devoted to public libraries, and particularly to reaching out to young people to bring them to libraries, I am especially pleased that Ms. Dove wanted to present a program which reaches out to young people. And I know the rest of us older folks will enjoy it too. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome, welcome to Rita Dove, Poet Laureate of the United States. Good afternoon, all of you. Oh, I'm glad he's doing that. I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to do it right. Good afternoon. I call this program, So You've Never Met a Poet, because when I was your age, and I think pretty much, I mean, most of the students here, I can easily say when I was your age, I had never met a poet. I didn't meet a poet, and by a poet I mean a published poet, a living, breathing poet, until I was in 11th grade. And up to that time, though I wrote poems and stories, and though I read voraciously, I love to read, it had never really occurred to me that those books that I loved so much were written by living, breathing people. Uh, quite a few of them, of course, they were written by people who, who were dead, but at one point they were alive, very much alive, and they had done things that you and I do every day of our lives. And so when I was 16 and met a living poet, and that was John Chardy, uh, it was like a bombshell had struck. It suddenly dawned to me that, that, that I could become a poet. And so one of the things that I've tried to do as Poet Laureate is to go around and meet young people because I think it makes all the difference in the world if you know that there are people out there who are doing some of the things that, that maybe you haven't even thought about doing. I thought what I would do first of all is to tell you a little bit about myself, how I became a poet, um, and before I tell you, what a poet laureate does, and then talk about what a poem is. I think I'm taking them in level of difficulty, because it's very difficult to talk about what exactly a poem is. I was born in Akron, Ohio. Does anyone know where, what Akron, Ohio is famous for? It's famous, well, it used to be famous for rubber tires. It's an industry. It's an industrial town. It's, it's industry. And it's not a beautiful town. Though, of course, there'll be someone from Akron in the audience who will chastise me afterwards for saying that. But it was not a beautiful town. To me, though, it was beautiful. And I remember, though, coming to Washington, D.C. for the first time when I was 10 years old. I visited cousins here in Washington, D.C. And that was the first time I saw a beautiful city. Uh, and I realized that, that there were places that looked other than Akron. But I grew up as the second oldest child of four children. And one of the places that we were allowed to go to when we were young without much supervision was the library. It was a place of freedom because I, we could say to our mother, we're, we're going to go get some more books. And uh, we could go off and do that. So um, I always associated books in the library with being able to go anywhere in the world that I wanted to go. You know, when you open up a book, you don't have to have ever been to China to read um, a, a Chinese fairy tale and get some sense of, of what it was like to be a woman with bound feet in China. You do not have to have been to Africa to read some of the Anansi, the wonderful folk tales about Africa, and to get a sense of, of some of those communities. But by opening a book, you can go there without even paying for a ticket. And so let me start with a poem. It's a recent poem. It's called The First Book. The first book, open it. Go ahead, it won't bite. Well, maybe a little. More a nip-like, a tingle. 
It's pleasurable, really. You see, it keeps on opening. You may fall in. Sure, it's hard to get started. Remember learning to use knife and fork? Dig in. You'll never reach bottom. It's not like it's the end of the world, just the world as you think you know it. I wrote that poem because I was asked by um, the Center for the Book at the Library of Congress if I had anything on, on encouraging children to read. And it dawned on me that, that, that very often kids and adults are afraid to read. They've had some bad experience with reading. They're afraid that they won't understand it, and that then they shut the book entirely. And always, I think, whenever you're going to open up a book that's challenging to you, that's new, it's a bit of a risk. It's like you never know what's going to meet you there. And that poem was really an, an a, a attempt to try to say, you know, jump in. You know, you'll never experience anything new, new unless you really try it. And um, to my mind, the first book is always you know, the next book you read is always the first book. It's always a new adventure. When I was growing up, going to the library and getting all those books out, I began to write, too. Now, when I began to write, I did not think about it as something to publish or to show anyone. I didn't know that, as I said, that writers existed. So I wrote for my own enjoyment. And what I wrote about, a lot of the times, were things that I didn't find in the books that I, that I was reading. Um, so I wrote myself into adventures. And sometimes I would write satires about my schoolmates, um, you know, give them different names, but they could really tell who they were. Uh, things like that. It was, it was fun. One of the first poems that I remember um, being proud of was in fourth grade. And it was an Easter poem. And... Um, I'll tell you why I was proud of it. I was proud of it because when I started writing the poem, I didn't know how it was going to end. We were told to write a poem about Easter, and so I just started writing this poem about a rabbit with a droopy ear, and I really didn't know how the rabbit was going to solve this problem. And so I kept writing, and as I wrote, the answer came to me, or you know, somehow I came up with the answer. And that was such magic to think that you could start out not quite knowing the answer, but thinking, I'll figure it out on the way, and have the poem uh, in a certain way tell me what the answer was, that I was hooked, and I began to, to write like crazy. Now, that poem, I think I can remember it, um, because it rhymed. So <laughs> let me see if I can do it. It was called The Rabbit with the Droopy Ear, and it was written in spring for Easter. And since for Easter is almost upon us, I think I can do it now. Mr. Rabbit was big and brown, but he always wore a frown. He was sad, even though spring was here, because he had one droopy ear. They were the handsomest ears in town, except one went up and one drooped down. And to think Easter was almost here, alas for the rabbit with the droopy ear. The rabbit went to wise old owl and told his tale between whine and howl. The owl just leaned closer to hear and said, I know the cure for your droopy ear. The next day, everyone gathered round to see the incident at the old oak tree. The rabbit was hanging upside down from a branch on the tree, and gone was his frown. Hip, hip, hooray, let's toast him a cup, for now both ears were hanging up. <laughs> oh, I was so happy. <laughs> And then it ends, you know, hip, 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 hooray, give him a cheer, hooray for the rabbit with the two straight ears. But, <laughs> okay, I fulfilled my requirement to write an Easter poem, but, but I think that one of the things about writing, when, when any of you write, whether it's a poem or a story or a play or, or even if you're writing a nonfiction piece of, of report, is to discover that, there, that you, either you remember things that you didn't think you remembered while you're writing it or that, in fact, um, something new happens while you're writing it. That spirit of discovery is something that happens in poetry and in fiction. Um, well, I continued to write poems. I didn't show them to very many people unless it was an assignment. And it really wasn't until I was in college that I began writing poems 
seriously, and by seriously I mean that I would write poems and then I would rewrite them, I would revise them. And uh, that's sometimes a sticking point. Young people will say, not only young people, believe me, some of my students at the university will say, well, I just, it just came to me in a rush and I wrote it down. But then I remember something that Gwendolyn Brooks once said. She said, if an idea just floats into your head, it probably just floated into a lot of other people's heads too. So what I discovered is really fun to work on a poem and to make it the very, very best poem it can be and to change some of the words. I'd like to read you a poem that's not my poem. It's a poem by Langston Hughes, but it's one of my favorite poems. But I think that Langston Hughes worked very hard to make this poem fit together just absolutely perfectly. This poem also rhymes, but not in the way that the um, rabbit poem rhymes. It rhymes more syncopated like. It's much more like jazz or boogie woogie. And some of you may know the poem. It's called Dream Boogie. But it's a poem that talks about inner children in Harlem, actually, who are playing one of those sidewalk games you know, with, with ropes. And so they've made up this little ditty to go with it. They talk about a dream deferred. Now, Langston Hughes, who you know is one of our great African-American poets, wrote a whole book called The Mon Montage of a Dream Deferred. A dream deferred is a dream that's been put off till later. And this is what has been told to many groups in, in this country, you know, wait until later and you'll get your piece of the pie. So that's what he means when he talks about a dream deferred. Good morning, Daddy. Ain't you heard the boogie-woogie rumble of a dream deferred? Listen closely. You'll hear their feet beating out and beating out a, do you think it's a happy beat? Listen to it closely. Ain't you heard something underneath like a, what did I say? Sure, I'm happy. Take it away. Hey, bop, rebop, mop, yeah. It's really a song. It just dances, doesn't it? And yet, you know, and it, it's a song, and I think it, what, what's nice about it, it catches both sides. It catches this, the, the, the happy tune, but also the dissatisfaction underneath, you know? You, you think it's a happy beat? Listen closely. There's something else underneath that. He was really wonderful, um, Langston Hughes, with talking about not only what you see on the surface of things, but what someone may be feeling inside. And I think that what a, the very best poems do is give you a glimpse at the inside. Now, all of you have thoughts that run through your head every single second of your life, right? Even while I'm talking, you've probably got a thousand thoughts going through your head, half of which don't really pertain to where we are. This happens to all of us, so it's nothing to be ashamed of. But the mind is an incredible thing. It can maintain lots of different thoughts at the same time. There are thoughts you will never tell anybody in your whole life, right? There are things you feel that you can't even explain how you feel. What happens with poems very often is that they can give you a glimpse into someone else's head for an instant. And then you discover that that person's head is a lot like yours, that, that the thoughts that you thought you had, which were kind of crazy, are not so crazy after all, that other people have the same kinds of feelings. So that's one of the things I've been trying to do as Poet Laureate, is to talk about those things inside of us that never reach the light that can be brought to light by a poem. Um, you may, one of the questions that you probably will ask or want to know about is what a poet laureate does. It's not at all a simple question. I've had people say, oh, this is a stupid question, what do you do? But the, the fact is, is that the poet laureate ship has been kept deliberately kind of wide open so that each poet laureate who comes in can decide how he or she wants to talk about poetry to the country. I, I've told people that in a certain way I feel that I've become a Miss America of poetry. You kind of, to go out and really promote poetry. One of the things I do do right here in Washington, D.C., and some of you may have heard of this, is uh, plan a literary season at the Library of Congress. There are a series of readings which are free and open to the public at the Library of Congress. And uh, some of them are by very famous and wonderful writers. In fact, tomorrow night, Jamaica Kincaid, 
who is a fiction writer, comes from Antigua, the West Indian Island, will be reading there. And some of the other programs, I've tried to do some things which are a little bit different. Like we had one program which was called Poetry and Jazz. We had poets, two poets, reading and a jazz quartet actually play together. I mean, the poets did their poems and the uh, jazz musicians actually played right behind them. We had a ball. And another thing I did, which happened just a couple of weeks ago, and this may be what some of you may know about, we had an evening called the Young Voices at the Library of Congress. And we had students from grades four through 10, actually, from all over Washington, D.C., come and read their poems. And there was an open mic reading afterwards. Because I feel that it's not only the published poets whose voices should be heard, but your voices as well. But besides planning those programs, what I've tried to do is go around the country and promote poetry in lots of different ways. One way is to talk to groups like yours. Another way is to go to the media. And that's why we've got these TVs set up. Because I wanted to show you, and it's, it's fairly brief, it's about five or so minutes, a montage of several different programs that I've done through the media. Let me tell you about them all first, because they follow one after another. And I don't know if we can stop in between. Um, the first thing you're going to see is a brief segment from a program called The Bill Moyers Show, which aired last April. Bill Moyers is on PBS, and he did an hour-long program with me. And what I've just excerpted for you here is just a little bit at the very beginning of the, of the program. You'll get a chance to see the Library of Congress, um, and this is where I work. So you have to come down sometime and visit me before I leave. The, other, the next video that you'll see well, you're going to see something that actually most people never see. This is a public service announcement that was done for Lifetime Cable. And what they did was do a series of poems as a public service announcement. Instead of a commercial, they had a 60-second poem. The poems are done with music and animation. The, they did 10 different poets. I've, you're going to see the one that I did uh, with one of my poems, which is called Flashcards. And what you're going to see that no one ever sees on television is the countdown. Um, when, when they feed things into television, everything has to be right down to the second. And if you've ever watched something, it usually happens late at night, you watch something and suddenly there's a blank space and there's blackness. Someone messed up. They didn't get the commercial in right on time. But what they have is a countdown so that they can, just like a disc jockey, plan when it's going to come in. So I've excerpted the whole thing for you. The third thing you're going to see is an excerpt that I did on Sesame Street which was lots of fun. I had to, I talked with Big Bird. And um, I think we're going to stop there. I have another thing, but I think that's enough for now, and then I'll go back to, to talking and reading and hearing your questions. So why don't we run this tape? I feel like Dave Letterman. This alone is what I wish for you. Knowledge. I keep feeling like telling people, you don't know what you're missing. To you know we are responsible for the lives we change. Each hurt swallow is a stone. Last words whispered to his daughter as he placed her fingertips lightly into the palm of her bloom. I would like to be able to know poetry much more of a household word than this now. It's making a deep feel anxiety that people have about poetry. I think poetry would do the rest itself. If you can't be free, in the next hour, be a mystery. Fort Laureate, Rita Dobbs. I'm Bill Moyers. As America's new poet laureate, Rita Dove's first official act was to write and read a poem commemorating the bicentennial of the U.S. Capitol. With her stained cheeks and whiskers and heat up temper, she had risen among us in blunt reproach. 
Lady Freedom Among Us was her meditation on the Statue of Freedom being returned to the Capitol Dome after its restoration. Having assumed the thick skin of this town, its gritted exhaust, its sun scorched and blear, she rests in her weathered plumage, big bones, resolute, no choice but to grant her space, crown her with stars, for she is one of the many, and she is each of us. She is our youngest Port Laureate, in a line that has included such venerables as Robert Ken Warren, Robert Lowell, Gwendolyn Brooks, and Robert Frost. Success came early for Rita Dove. In 1987, at age 35, she won the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry for Thomas and Beulah, a series of poems about her grandparents. While her poems have won her a national following, she has also published a novel, a book of short stories, and just last month, a new play. Even as a child back in Akron, Ohio, Rita Dove stood out, becoming a presidential scholar in high school, one of the 100 best students in the country. The recognition kept coming, summa cum laude from Miami University in Ohio, a Fulbright scholarship to Germany. She is married now to the German novelist Fred Bebon. In the last year alone, she was named Commonwealth Professor of English at the University of Virginia. Woman of the Year, Rita Dove. Celebrated in the popular press and honored by the NAACP. She is all the world fit. That's the countdown. Neon presents Woman to Woman on My Time. Flashcard. In math, I was the whiz kid, keeper of oranges and apples. What you don't understand, master, my father said. The faster I answered, the faster they came. I could see one bud on the teacher's geranium, one clear bee sputtering at the wet cane. The tulip trees always dragged after heavy rain, so I tucked my head as my boots flapped home. My father put up his feet after work and relaxed with a highball and the light of Lincoln. After supper, we drilled, and I climbed the dark before sleep, before a thin voice hit numbers as I spun on the wheel. I had to guess. Ten, I kept saying. I'm only ten. Here comes Sesame Street. Doesn't write poems. 
sorry, maybe next time. Yes, I do. I do write poems. I have one right here, in fact. Well, great. Okay. Get ready for it, Dan. Perfect bird. If I could just find a word to describe what I heard this morning outside my window. There was a flutter of wings, then the air tinkling like a thousand diamonds spilling to the floor. Soft as the first real snow, bright as a clown's fake nose, the song went on and on. I listened for an hour or more, or maybe I was dreaming. Oh, for the right word to describe its singing, now that the bird is gone. Oh. <laughs> Say, I like that. A poem about a singing bird. La, 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 la. Very good, big bird. Uh -huh. Well, thank you. <laughs> and there you have it. A poem by Rita Dow. A poem I really, really love. Why, big bird, what you just said was a poem. It was? Yeah. You know, I think you're the poet laureate of Sesame Street. Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> then uh, that's big laureate. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> oh, Snuffy, dear Snuffy, so large and so puffy. I think he's going to do a great job. His snuffle is snuffly and really long enoughly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was lots of fun to work with Big Bird. We had to do it about five times, um, mainly because either I would mess up a line or he would mess up a line. Or one time I remember we had to redo it because the shadow of his beak was falling over my face and the cameraman said, wait, stop. And they had to add some more light. Um, but my feeling is that to do things like Sesame Street and to do things like this is a way of also bringing poetry into everybody's living room. And it's lots of fun to do, too. So it's really been fun. In these things that you saw, there were several things which I probably should explain. One of them is um, during the Bill Moyers segment, he talked about my getting a Pulitzer Prize for Thomas and Beulah, and that's included in the book that you're going to get today. And I wanted to talk a little bit about those poems because um, it could be a very good example of how poems can help lead you on to something that you weren't, that you weren't sure you were going to write about before. These poems were about my grandparents, my maternal grandparents. And it started with a story that my grandmother told me. My grandmother told me a story about my grandfather when he was a young man, when he was 19 or 20, and he had come north on a riverboat. He played, uh, he sang, and he had a friend who played the mandolin, and they would play the riverboats as they went up and down the Mississippi. And she said that he, one day, his best friend, he dared his best friend to dive into the river and swim over to an island, and his friend drowned. And at that point, my grandfather decided to give up the liver, riverboat life and he stopped and ended up going to Akron, Ohio for the jobs in those rubber factories and met my grandmother. So that was the story, and I heard this story when I was about 13 or 14. And all my life after that, it haunted me because I had never thought of my grandparents, my grandfather, as a young man. I always thought of him as my grandfather, not as someone who had a life long before me. And so when I began writing the poems for that book, I started out with a single poem I didn't think to myself, I'm going to write this whole book about my grandparents, but I wanted to write one poem about this drowning. And this is the poem, The Event. Ever since they'd left the Tennessee Ridge with nothing to boast of but good looks and a mandolin, the two Negroes leaning on the rail of a riverboat were inseparable, Lem plucked to Thomas's silver falsetto. But the night was hot and they were drunk. They spat where the wheel churned mud and moonlight. They called down to the tarantulas among the bananas to come out and dance. You're so fine and mighty. Let's see what you can do, said Thomas, pointing to a tree-capped island. Lem stripped, spoke easy, 
Them's chestnuts, I believe, dove quick as a gasp. Thomas, dry on deck, saw the green crown shake as the island slipped under, dissolved in the thickening stream. At his feet, a stinking circle of rags, the half-shell mandolin. Where the wheel turned, the water gently shirred. Now, there's several things about this poem that I didn't know when I started writing it, and I wanted to talk about that with you. First of all, I did know that my grandfather had come from Tennessee, and that he worked on the riverboats. I didn't know the name of his friend, so I made one up. Yes, you can do that. I made it, I, I gave his friend the name of Lem. And I knew no Lems, so I thought it was a safe name to use. But Thomas was my, fa my, my grandfather's name. Um, one of the things I had to decide, and this is the kind of thing that happens when you rewrite poems, I had to decide what to call them. And I decided to call them Negroes because in 1921, which was when this was taking place, that's the term that people would have used. They would not have used African Americans or blacks or, well, they might have used colored, heaven forbid. But Negro was basically the word they used. So that was a very conscious decision. And I did not know when I started the poem that what Thomas was going to do at the end of it when his friend drowned. I knew he was going to drown, but I didn't know where exactly it was going to end. And so as I wrote the poem and described the drowning, it dawned to me that since there was nothing left of his friend, the thing he would concentrate on would be, what, would be just his clothes, the clothes that were left of the friend, which the poem describes as a stinking circle of rags, all right? Um, and then the mandolin, which his friend leaves behind. And from that moment, because that was all that, le that was left of his friend, I realized that my grandfather would pick up the mandolin, that that was the last thing left of his friend. Now, my grandfather did play the mandolin. He died before I ever had a chance to ask him where he learned to play it, how he learned to play it, you know, why he continued to play it. And so right at that point in these poems, some fiction came in because I had decided that the mandolin belonged to his friend. Um, it's a tricky thing, writing and writing things. People often think that when you write, you write something, it, it's absolutely true. And even if it's a novel, they think, well, it must have happened to the writer. What often happens when someone writes something is that they mix fact with fantasy. For instance, there's another case in here, and I will read you this poem um, too. That my grandmother used to tell me a story about my grandfather courting her. That's when people went through these long, elaborate rituals of walking them home and staying on the, sitting with them for just a little while. This went on for months because my grandmother was a very stubborn woman. And she said that he gave her, the first present he gave her was a blue scarf. And I remember my grandmother describing the scarf to me. And I think that's really what won her over. What I did in these poems was to change the color of the scarf to yellow. The reason why I did that was because, and I think you'll see why in this poem, because I wanted to try to describe how my grandmother felt about that scarf. She described how it seemed so soft, it just seemed to flow, it seemed to like just run over her hands. And I didn't want it to be water because I didn't want it to be associated with something sad, which was like the, the Mississippi River and the fact that the guy drowned in it. So I changed the color to yellow. And this is the poem that came out of this. And this is told from the woman's point of view, the grandmother. My grandmother got married late. She was 26. That was considered late in those days. She said she was going to wait for the right man to come along, and she didn't care what anybody said. So. But my grandfather, I think, played his mandolin right into her heart. The poem is called Courtship Diligence. And diligence refers to my grandfather being so patient courting this woman. A yellow scarf runs through his fingers as if it were melting. Thomas dabbing his brow. And now his mandolin in a hurry, though the night, as they say, is young, though she is getting on. Hush, the strings tinkle, pretty gal. Cigar box music, 
She'd much prefer a pianola and scent in a sky-colored flask. Not that scarf, bright as butter. Not his hands, cool as dimes. So what happens? I changed it to yellow so I could have that butter melting in her hands. Now, I have to admit that I was afraid to show any of these poems to my mother until the whole book was finished. But after it was finished and I showed it to her, she said to me, well, you know, it was true even though it wasn't true. <laughs> I think what she meant by that was that it was true in the heart. All the facts were not quite true, but it was kind of true in the heart. Um, one of the things that a poem can do that sometimes fiction does, but not all the time, is that a poem can actually sing. I mean, it has rhythms in it that make, make it feel like you can actually sing it. That poem by Langston Hughes' Dream Boogie was, one, was a case in point. Um, it also, a poem can, can paint a picture. This is a very short poem by Carl Sandburg, who was a poet um, who wrote in the early part of the century. And in this poem, and some of you may have heard it, it's a very short poem, he describes fog. And the fog that he is describing is in Chicago, which was his city. Fog. The fog comes on little cat feet. It sits looking over harbor and city on silent haunches and then moves on. It's very short, right? But there's that little line, the fog comes on little cat feet. And if you've ever seen how fog is, suddenly it seems to creep in. It creeps in like cats sometimes creep into a room. So that one paints a little picture. And it also moves a little bit like fog. It moves very slowly, but suddenly the whole poem is over, like fog suddenly disappears. How does a poem make its music? There's one thing to say what you mean, to tell some, your friend what you mean. But have you ever had a friend who could tell a story so well that that's the person you always wanted to hear the stories from, you know? Or someone who can tell a joke really well? Those people are people who know how to use words in such a way that they seem to dance. And one of the things in rewriting poems that I do is to try to find words that not only mean what I want to say, but sound like what I want to say. I'd like to do a little experiment and ask you to, I'm going to encourage you to be a little noisy. I bet you'll like that. Um, because what I'd like you to do is to call out words that occur to you when I describe what I want, OK? I want you for a moment to try to forget what words mean and think about how they sound, OK? And what I'd like to do is to have you just call out, first of all, words that sound loud, words that seem to make a noise. Some of these words are words that are actually are words for noise. Do you want to just, just, you don't have to raise your hand. I don't want to call, but if you just want to call out your word, then I'll say it over the microphone in case someone wants. Boom. It really sounds like what it is. Boom. With a microphone, I can do it really well. OK, other words? Come on, yell out a word. Thump, I heard. Help? Did I hear help? OK. Thump. Pow. Pow. What was that over there? Ow. Ow. If we're going to do pow, we have to do ow. And we have to do ouch. We have to do ouch, too, which is a different kind of pain than ow, isn't it? I mean, ow is when you go, ow, but ouch is this kind of pain where you clamp down on it. What was that over there? Huh? Ah. Poof. Poof's a good one. Bang. Bang is a good one. OK, one more. Crack and scream. I heard two at the same time. But crack, think about the way crack I mean, it does mean crack, but what's, what's so wonderful about that word is that it actually sounds like what it, what it means. And 
scream also sounds like what a scream is like. You know, people go, e. Another word that sounds like itself is shriek. Now, a shriek is a little higher than a scream, isn't it? You have all these different choices. And if you're going to write a poem where someone is going to yell, shout, scream, or cry, you have all these different sounds to get into the air. But now let's turn it around and think of quiet words. Shh. We've heard that a lot, I bet. <laughs> we're in a library, so we're going to say shh. And what was that other one? Quiet. Now, quiet is one of those interesting words. You can say it quietly, or someone can make it sound like if you don't keep quiet, they're going to crack you over the head, right? But quiet. You can, you can make it sound rough, too. Hush. Silence. See, what silence and quiet both do is they draw out the word so you hear the silence, too. Very nice. Yeah. Sleep. Sleep, just like a hypnotist, you're getting very sleepy. Yeah. Hmm? Nap. Nap. Now, nap is one of those words that actually sounds a little bit different than what it is, but a nap is a short sleep. So the word is short, too. Hmm? I heard lullaby, which is a nice, which reminds me of hush. It, it actually moves just like a lullaby, and lull, which is a nice one too. Slumber, slumber. Okay, here's something that's a little harder, but you're doing so well, you probably can do this too. How about words that sound ugly? <laughs> All right, <laughs> okay. Now, why does that sound ugly? <laughs> Well, it's true that, that commands, anything that's a command is usually tends to sound ugly because it's supposed to get your attention, right? So if you say shut up or shut up or um, um, ugly, someone just said ugly, didn't they? Yeah, ugly is a very ugly word. It's, it, it fills up your mouth. What was that, hate? Stupid, yeah. It's, it's, it's as if someone is spitting on you, right? Idiot. I heard idiot. Okay. Just so that everyone can hear. Idiot is another word. It's very interesting that the words that are meant to make people feel bad are very often ugly sounding words. But then there is something else, and this is where irony comes in. Do you know what irony is? Sarcasm? That's, yeah, I think uh, you use it all the time, whether you know or not. But that's when you use a word or you use anything that you, you want it to mean the opposite of what you say. That can be something like um, saying, oh, yeah, that's really great. And it's the way you say it that, that makes great suddenly a very ugly word. Um, sometimes poems can do that as well. By, but, but they can't do it just with a single word because when you read a poem on the page, you can't hear it, right? What it, they do it by the way it's put in the whole poem. I'm going to read you a poem which has a little bit of that irony in it, too. Now, this poem is called The Island Women of Paris, and let me explain a little bit about it. These are The women I'm talking about are women from the, the West Indian Islands, who, which originally belonged to France. So this would be Martinique and um, Guadeloupe, places like these. These women, I, when I was in Paris, they wore the most incredible outfits. I mean, the turbans and the, and the caftans and just bright colors where most of the Parisians were walking around in gray. And they had a way not only of walking as if they knew everybody was looking at them and they didn't mind, um, but they also had a way of walking that made you feel, if you were not dressed like them, totally unimportant, insignificant. So this poem is about how they move. And the last uh, word is a word that I labored over a long time to try to get that right little bite in there. And I think it's as much the sound of the word as it is the meaning of the word. Another little thing to tell you about the poem is that um, Many of these 
is that France has a policy of, of allowing people from the islands to come. They can go anywhere in France. Many of them have moved to Paris, but they are not often very welcome there. The island women of Paris skim from curb to curb like regatta. You know what a regatta is? A regatta is a whole fleet of ships, usually very beautiful looking ships. The island women of Paris skim from curb to curb like regatta, from Pont Neuf to the Quai de la Rap, in cool negotiation with traffic, each a country to herself, transposed to this city by a fluke called imperial courtesy. The island women glide past, held aloft by a wire running straight to heaven. It means they're standing very tall. Who can ignore their ornamental bearing? Turbans haughty as parrots, or deft braids carved into airy cages, transfixed on their manifest brows. The island women move through Paris as if they had just finished inventing their destination. It's better not to get in their way. And better not look an island woman in the eye, unless you like feeling unnecessary. So that was the word I was looking for. To get that, to get that little bite. I think what I should do now is to stop and to ask if you have any questions, and I hope you do because it's very hard for me standing up here to know exactly what's on your mind. And I think that they've decided to do it in such a way that you come up to the microphone. Is that correct? Or shall I just take it as they come? OK. So there's going to be a microphone up here. And there also will be one in the back. And the best thing to do is just to get up and to line up at the microphone, and then you can ask a question. Everyone can hear it, OK? Please don't be shy. Don't be like I was when I was your age. I was very shy. Just line up. Come on, stand up. Come on. Come on over. Move, move. What's your name? Dion. Hi, Dion. Uh, the question was, where do I live in the United States? I live in Virginia, Charlottesville, Virginia, which is about two hours south of here. And what I do is I come up to Washington either on the train or I drive up. I teach at the University of Virginia there. Before that, I lived in Ohio. Well, let me put it this way. First, I lived in Ohio. Then I moved to Arizona. I lived in Arizona for eight years. And now I live in Virginia. So I'm not too far away. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, I have two questions. OK. My first question is, uh, how would you go about getting your work uh, published, uh, publicized? Mm -hmm. OK. Shall I answer that first? Yes, um, please. The question was, how do you go about getting your work published or publicized? The best way, and this is the way that most people do it, is to first start publishing your work in magazines. And um, there are lots of not only uh, literary magazines, and by literary magazines, I mean magazines that publish short stories and poems exclusively, but also what they call the slicks. That's because the magazines that have the slick covers, mm -hmm. like The New Yorker or Essence or Good Housekeeping. Those usually only publish one or two poems or stories. There is a book that you can get right here in the library in the reference section called The Writer's Market. And it comes out every year. And what it does is it gives you an overview of the whole, you know, of, of publishing, whether it's nonfiction, you know, whether it's articles or poems or stories. And they can tell you how to go about it. But usually an editor, if you're going to have a book published, the editor will want to know if you've published individual things before. So you start by publishing your individual things. Okay. My second question is, what do you do when 
you lose your inspiration, you run dry uh, trying to write. Okay. What do you do when you lose your inspiration? Well, my philosophy is that uh, inspiration comes to those who work. My feeling is that, though there is certainly such a thing as inspiration, many a day I will go and sit down at my desk without an idea in my head. I keep a notebook. Um, I keep many notebooks, but the one I have with me now is small because, you know, I'm traveling. I keep a notebook, and in that notebook, I jot down anything that catches my attention. I don't ask what it means. I don't ask if it's important. If it's something I overhear in the metro, if it's a blouse that I see someone has on that I think looks like something else, I'll just write it down. Um, if it's a word, like ragamuffin, or some word that I think is a great word, I'll write it down. And sometimes going back to the notebooks helps when you don't have an idea. Do you find your job fun, hard, or sort of in between? And which one it is? If so, why? Okay, that's a very good question. Do I find my job fun, hard, or somewhat in, or some in between, and why? It's rarely in between, but there are times when I, I find it very hard, and there are times when I find it lots of fun. There are times when I find it both hard and fun. What's fun about it is to be able to talk about what I love to people. And there are some things which are lots of fun that I never thought I'd get a chance to do, like Sesame Street, you know, or going to the White House, or reading uh, in front of the Capitol building. These are things I never dreamed of in my wildest dreams. And that's fun. The hard thing is not having enough time in the day to do everything I want to do. Not, you know, I, one of the hard things is that I get lots of letters and I try to answer all of them. And sometimes it takes me a couple of months to just get through the letters. And I feel guilty about not answering those letters right away. So that's why it's sometimes fun and sometimes hard. Was your experience with Big Bird kind of funny? Like, did he goof off in some way? Was my experience with Big Bird kind of funny? Or? And goofing off. Do you goof, was he goofing off? Well, you know, I don't know if I should tell you who Big Bird really is. Maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> Big Bird is a, is, is a guy, of course, <laughs> he's a guy. But uh, he doesn't look like Big Bird, let's put it that way. So we, we did goof off a lot uh, at the beginning, we talked. And it was kind of fun because the man who plays Big Bird took off, and he didn't have that Big Bird's head on while we rehearsed, because the outfit is very hot. And so we would rehearse and out would come this Big Bird voice, and there'd be this man's head looking at me. <laughs> And I would crack up. I'd laugh every time he talked. I said, I'm sorry, I can't do this. You don't look like Big Bird. So we goofed off a little bit. It was fun. Thank you. How did you get your career started? Pardon? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it quite. How did you get your career started? How did I get my career started? I got started by publishing, first I published poems in my college magazine. There was a magazine there and I published poems in there. In fact, I published some poems in, in high school, in the high school newspaper, I think. It was at a story. I can't remember. Then I, I took English courses in college. I also took writing courses, creative writing courses, where we wrote poems and stories and discussed them. I think that really helped to read a lot of poets and to, to have other people um, offer suggestions on my work. Uh, after I had published in magazines for a few years, I put together a manuscript of poems and began sending it out to, to publishers who published poetry. And what I did was to look, um, I had read lots of books of poetry, so those publishers whose books I really liked, I sent my book to. And that's how I got started. My first book was published with Carnegie Mellon Press. Uh, which is a university press that publishes poetry. And they, in fact, published my first three books. And then I, um, I went to another publisher in New York. So that's how I started, though, with one poem, one poem at a time. Next, please. I think you're next. What made you be a poet? What made me be a poet? You know, I've asked this question of myself a lot. I don't know 
what really made me be a poet. I, it seemed like that was what I always wanted to do. I think that there, that storytelling was really important among my relatives, you know, that you'd sit around at 4th of July or some the Memorial Day and they would start gossiping and they'd tell stories. So I love to listen to the stories. That should have made me a short story writer, right? But I also think that there was a lot of music in my life. Um, you know, I heard music all the time. I liked to dance. I played uh, a musical instrument, the cello. And I think it's that musical stuff that made me want to be a poet. Because when you're a poet, you really get to play around with the way the words sound. I think that's why. When you were young, who was your favorite poet? When I was young, who was my favorite poet? Hmm. Let me go back. Ah. That's hard. I think that because it, it, it's hard to know when. Because when I was growing up, there were very few books of poems that were geared for children. One of my earliest loves was Langston Hughes, but also Shakespeare. Uh, not the poems, but the plays. What happened was, I was about 11 or 12, and what happened was that there was a book of Shakespeare plays on the bookshelf at home. And I just picked it up and started to read um, and no one told me it was supposed to be hard. And I think that was the secret. If I had known that people study this in you know, universities and stuff, I would have been terrified and convinced that I didn't understand it. And uh, so those plays are what I first read, and they were really exciting. And they are written as poems. So. Is being a poet a good career? Is being a poet a good career was the question. Let me go right and say you don't make money being a poet. I can tell you that, I mean, what I make my money from um, is teaching. I teach English at the University of Virginia. I think it's a good career because I'm doing what I love. I mean, I think that one of the things you should ask yourself as you're growing up and as you're trying to decide what to do with your life, keep asking yourself, what do you enjoy doing? And then look around and see if there's some job that'll fit that. Um, because the secret to success, and the secret to a good job, is doing something that you really like to do. So that you really want to go to work in the morning because it's what you want to do anyway. How old were you when you started writing poems? How old was I when I first started writing poems? Well, I began writing really when I was like in, um, third or fourth grade, I began writing uh, comic books first. That was what I first wrote. My brother and I would write, make up our own comic characters. And then I began writing poems. But like I said, I wrote them for fun, you know. Another one that my brother used to write them too, one of his um, poems, I still remember, it was kind of silly. It was said, the cowboy is walking down the street eating his favorite candy treat. The cowboy comes up the street again eating his candy treat the end. Was, we did stuff like that. It was fun. <laughs> You're welcome. Hello. It's, um, it's loud. It's um, really nice to see you. Thank I'm you. pleased to be able to be in this room with you. Um, I think your poetry is wonderful. Proud to have you as um, Poet Laureate for the U.S. Thank you. Thank um, you. I just want to ask what, in your view, as a poet, what makes a poet a poet? What makes a poem a poem. I mean, how do you, is it purely self-definition? It's, you know, it, I, I don't believe it's purely self-definition, but like many things in this world, the, the borders are gray. Um, it's very hard to describe exactly what a poem is. Um, one of the definitions that Robert Frost gave was that a poem is the best words in the best order. I think what that means is that everything counts in a poem, not just what is said, but how it's said and, um, and how it looks even on the page. Uh, I, I, poem does not have to rhyme, but it does have to pay attention to language, not only in terms of its meaning, but its history and its, its uh, personality, you could almost say, of a word. I think that kind of care is what is always contained in a poem.
know if your family was here and do you have any small children? The question was, is my family here and do I have any small children? My family is not here today. They'll be coming up tomorrow. Um, I have a daughter who is 12. And uh, she's just almost not a, a child anymore. But she had to grow up with me writing poems. And uh, she likes to write short stories. When's her birthday? She's an Aquarius. I think it's in January, January 25th. What's your yearly income? <laughs> These are the kind of questions you don't have to ask unless you're <laughs> in front of Congress, right? A congressional hearing. Um, I really, I really can't say that. Um, but I can tell you that I think because I'm a professor, I, well, let's put it, I have several incomes. I teach at the university, so I have a, my salary as a professor. I will get um, royalty statements from my books, which means that, um, that after they finish paying for themselves, after they've covered the cost, I get 10%, I think, of the sales. Those royalty checks really could buy you a hamburger, maybe, you know, or maybe two hamburgers. Um, I mean, sometimes you, can, you hear of, of writers getting advances of, of a million dollars and stuff like that, but most writers do not get advances that large. And even if, for instance, you get an advance of, say, uh, 20000 which is um, an advance that I got for a novel, the work that I put into the novel was five years. So that was $20,000 for five years. Because after that, you don't really see any money anymore. So um, that, those are the kind of things that where my money comes in from. Out of all your poems, which one do you like the most? Out of all my poems, which one do I like the most? You know, I don't have a favorite. It's sort of like children. One shouldn't have favorite children, <laughs> and I don't. And I think maybe the poem that's my favorite is the one that I haven't written yet, the one that I'm just really eager to get to and write. All right, what are the advantages and disadvantages of writing poetry? What are the advantages and disadvantages of writing poetry? The advantages, I think, are, first of all, the feeling, it's an incredible feeling of, of freedom and, and of connection, because what I do when I write poems is that I really try to get at emotions and thoughts that may not emerge in a normal conversation. And then to read the poem to someone or have them read it and to say, I, I know what you mean. It's a wonderful feeling to feel that, that you're connected with somebody else. That's one of the advantages to the poem. One of the disadvantages to poetry is that in this society, in this country, you know, um, people, a lot of people are afraid of poetry. And I was never afraid of it, and I've been trying to show people that it really is a lot of fun. But always, I find myself often running up against people saying, poetry, oh, I don't understand it. And I think if we think of poetry more li like we think of music, we don't explain music, we just let it wash over us. Poems can do the same thing, that um, people will be less afraid of it. So that's one of the disadvantages, always having to explain it. When was your first book published? When was my first book published? That's a good question. Uh, my first book was published in 1977. And it was, this was a very small book. It was only 10 poems, and it was a, a, what, what they call a chat book. My first real book of poems was published in 1980. Seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? <laughs> Seems like yesterday to me. A young kid my, like, like myself, I write poetry. Um, I wanted to know how would I get started, you know? poetry business. Well, you're already started because the thing to remember is that the poetry business, or as one of my teachers used to call it, po-biz, <laughs> poetry business always begins with the poem. You know, the thing that is the most exciting about being a poet is actually writing the poem. I would recommend that um, if you were thinking about publishing poems, things like that, that you check with your librarian and look 
for, first of all, for magazines about in your age group, because there are some, the scholastic magazines that publish poems, because they do publish poems by, you know, by students. That's the first thing. But I also think that you could, you should take advantage of any kind of writing classes. Sometimes there are writing classes done at the university, uh, done at the libraries, or, um, you know, workshops, little workshops on writing, because it's very helpful to have someone else read your poems and make suggestions and for you to see what other people are doing. How do you feel about writing poems? How do I feel about writing poems? You know, I feel both exhilarated and frustrated almost all the time. Every time I sit down to write a poem um, and to work on a poem, I can guarantee you that there are moments when I feel like I'm on top of the world and there are other moments when I think, how did I ever write anything in my life? And I think it's because I'm always trying to do something new. I mean, you have to challenge yourself. So, but that's a good feeling. I, I mean, I think anything that's worth anything is going to be, you've got to work at it a little bit. I was, I was wondering if, um, I was wondering if you have reached your goal yet in life. Ah, uh, if I've reached my goal yet. <sighs> you know, the, the trick is, is, I don't have a goal, or let's say I have goals and they just, you just, you have, the trick is to always add another goal. Um, I must say that I never, ever dreamed that I would become Poet Laureate of the United States. And so often people will say, well, you've reached your goal, this is the highest you can go, blah, blah, blah. But what I feel the highest you can go is to really write the next thing. It does not matter how many prizes, you know, I've had or anything like that. When every time I go and sit down at my desk to write, it's a whole new ball game, and there's going to be new excitements and frustrations. So I don't think I'll ever reach my goal, I, whatever that goal would be. There's How many languages do you speak? How many languages do I speak? Well, I only speak English and German fluently. Um, I know very little Spanish. I know some Spanish, enough to get me through Spain, and, <laughs> and uh, a little bit of French, but um, that's it. I wish I knew more languages, and it's one of the things I could say to you guys right now. Go for it. You've got the brains for it. When you get my age, you know, your brain just stops or something. And it's really hard to learn new languages, but you're just, you know, this is a world where you're going to have to learn to speak other languages, and it's, it's really fun, so you should do it. Um, since you are um, a professor for English, you probably have to grade a lot of written arts, right? So um, how do you um, grade like, poems from your students? It's a very good question. It is always a problem, how to grade a poem. Uh, because, of course, it's a very subjective thing. What I do is I tend, I don't grade the poems. I do give final grades, but I don't grade the poems themselves. Part of, I do, I write all over them, and I write all sorts of suggestions. And part of the reason why I do that is because sometimes students will try to get an A, whatever that is, and s forget about the poem. And so I tell students who are in my classes, I said, if you are uptight about your grades, and if that's what you're looking for, then you're looking for the wrong thing in this class, because in life there are no grades, and we're just going to, you know, we're, we're in this together. So I try not to do um, any grading on individual poems, but it is a very, very difficult thing to do. For the, well, I want to thank you all very much for those great questions for being here. Thank you. I was, um, I think you can do a little better than that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Now that's the kind of the reception that she deserves. Uh, I'd just like to mention that all of the books that you see here and on the table with the red uh, cloth on it, you may check those books out. And that shows your appreciation for all that she said and has done.
up to this point. Become familiar with it. And uh, then a lot of the questions that you had, you had some good questions, I must say. And we wish that we had time to do it. But we have a um, time uh, limit here because the youngsters have to get back to the school. So the bus transportation is available. And I think there's one other thing. Uh, Ms. Shoshani will come up. Wendy Blair is from the um, Literary Friends of the Public Library. Thank you. Aren't they beautiful? Look at these. Now those are some great flowers. All different. Thank you. On behalf of the literary friends, I would like to thank our most wonderful, beautiful, and very, very special Ms. Rita Bell. Thank you so much. Hello, Ms. Bell. My name is Lynette Yogi. This is Alicia Middleton, and this is Henry Fernandez. We are fifth graders at Brightwood Elementary School, and, and we would like to present you with these flowers and this book of poems that our class wrote. Thank you very much. This is wonderful. So your class wrote these poems, huh? Yeah. That's great. My daughter's in sixth grade now, so she just, you know, left elementary school. Bear poetry, B-E-A-R. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I'll be writing you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's get a picture. Hello. Um, let's get a picture. I might, uh, I might remind you that this is the second Port Laureate who has graced uh, our facilities here. Uh, Gwendolyn Brooks was the first, and now we have uh, Rita Dove. Isn't she warm and approachable? You know, you can be big and not act up. And she is, she's just wonderful. She really is. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> 